welcome back. Here are my three guests, the violin, <laughs> <laughs> of which you will see a little bit more at the end of this uh, uh, conversation. Joshua Bell, Sigmund Rolat. There is a quote of Huberman, which I want to read for you, that after World War I, and uh, after realizing what is happening in Nazi Germany, uh, he writes, I quote, I had to descend into the further depths of my soul to find the hidden link between my impulses towards art and my impulse towards po politics. Mm. And then I made a huge discovery. The true artist does not create art as an end in itself. He creates art, art for human beings. Humanity is the goal. Uh, and in the documentary, uh, one, people, well, one of the people said, you know, now a great musician wants to become a, a conductor, a great musician at that time wanted to change the world. What is for you, you know, how do you respond to this? How do you respond to the huge um, symbolic, I mean, this, this filing became an icon, and it became an icon for, for the whole idea. Um, what kind of moral political responsibility mm. is related to art? Well, this is, this is a this is a interesting question, and it's and it's obviously it's easy to say yes, we should all be involved in, in good causes, etc. But it's a more complex, uh, I think, issue when it comes to art. First of all, the the quote at the end that you said, at one time uh, now we, a violinist wants to become a conductor, and at other and at a previous time yeah, they wanted to change the world. The, I actually I'm not, I don't quite understand that quote because they're two completely different things. Becoming a conductor is enhancing yourself as a musician, and and the other, saving the world, is, is something else. And it's one, both are things that to, to put them parallel like that, I think is is uh, I don't wouldn't it's subscribe to that. Uh, so and you can do both. There's no reason. <laughs> there's the, so so I, I don't quite understand that. The other the other thing that Huberman talked about as far as politics, it's a difficult question because there's. Something about, I mean, art is somehow transcendent of politics. Politics, when I think of politics, I think of, I think what he did, what Huberman did was more humanitarian than political, I would, I would say. But I, I guess my, my association with politics is something not so positive, and I don't, I, I don't like to associate myself with political parties and political, politicized thinking. I think the art is so far above that. It's something that brings people together. Politics puts people in groups, and, I, and I, that's something that I don't believe art is about that. I don't think there's, it's about the individual and, and raising one's self-worth uh, and, and, and gives you meaning for living in this world. It doesn't talk, I don't believe art speaks about, uh, a symphony speaks about about politics or communities, it's about being a human being, and I think that's more important. Uh, Yet at the same time, uh, 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 there is also this other school, and the most representative therefore is is somebody like Furtwängler, and it's also in the uh, documentary that Hobermann deliberately refused to play uh, 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 at the Berlin Philharmonic by Furtwängler, although Furtwängler also, you know, had this great faith in music and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, Beethoven and Bruckner and Bruckner again. So, it's, you know, I, it's just the Furtwängler issue is interesting because he's, it's very easy just to say, oh, he was, he was terrible for not standing up and Hubermann did and he did not. It's also very complex. Hubermann was in a different position than Furtwängler. Furtwängler had his orchestra, who he felt loyal to. There are many complex, he could have done more, I'm sure, but I would hate to, jump on the bandwagon and make him into someone mm -hmm. terrible. Uh, I just, I happen to have been reading your book uh, 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 recently, uh, and it's funny that I, I actually bookmarked it, and I didn't intend, I didn't know we were going to talk about this, but um, uh, this fantastic book, if you haven't read, Nobility of Spirit. Um, we say fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I really, really love, but it's interesting, um, there's a quote that you put in here from Goethe, where it says, he says, uh, says um, a good work of art can and will have moral consequences, but to require moral ends of the artist is to ruin his craft. You put that in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but also, since we're also talking here, I think that's the, uh, the uh, part of the title of our symposium here. We're talking about 
What is the title of it? Holocaust and the Power of Music. Exactly. And the Holocaust, you see, the, the, uh, after all, the Holocaust was, uh, well, at, at least the one in the 1930s and 1940s, was almost exclusively a German enterprise. Now, with respect to that, the Minister of Culture, a very able guy, very glib, Goebbels, decided that the most German of all arts is music, you see. And so most musicians, almost all of them, very able musicians who are part and parcel of the great orchestras of Germany, were fired. Now, when Germans, the Kulturträger, as they were known in the 1930s, came into Poland, one of the first decrees which was issued was that not only were Jews not allowed to play in the orchestras, but the Jews were not allowed to play German music. Now, after all, you take the three Bs, you know, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, I mean, how could you not play them? And you see, it really is worth noting that Jews, you know, I have here even a quotation from a great musicologist in Warsaw, who wrote during the uh, occupation that Jews risked their lives, and they risked certainly going to prison at the beginning, only prison threatened them, for playing actually in these underground, for example, concerts. What was the most favorite actually? Certainly at that time, the Ninth Symphony was more often played in the Ode to Joy than any other single piece of music. So you see, uh, it's, it's interesting, you know, how Jews, those at whom all of this was directed, how they thought about this very subject. It's interesting because um, it just shows how art and music does transcend uh, politics, that if you look at the program, the Israel, do you know what the program was? That first big concert with Toscanini and the Israel Philharmonic, they've just fled Germany and the horror of Nazis. Uh, you know what their program was? Brahms Symphony, Mendelssohn Midsummer Night's Dream. It was almost entirely German music. Now, isn't that, I think that's fascinating that they would, that they would feel inclined to play German music after they've just left this horror and yet they did because, I mean, this music, it transcends. It's not about being German, it's about being a hu human. It, 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 uh, it's, it shows the greatest humanity uh, in the music. And uh, I think that's, an, uh, that's, that's the service that music really provides besides standing up in front of uh, Congress. It's, it's about, it's, it's making the audience feel like fellow human beings, making them know themselves, through the music, and therefore, I think it makes the world a much better place. It can uh, having music, and I think it has an important place in society. It, it, it seems to me that you're living almost according to uh, the biblical commandment, "Sakor, remember." You also said it in the documentary. For you, it is important to remember. Why? Well, that is, uh, you know, there is uh, in, in Hebrew there is a almost a commandment, le dor vidor, uh, which r roughly says you have to uh, communicate from your generation to the next generation, le dor vidor. And uh, I can only play, tell you personally that to me that uh, is particularly important because you see the last words that my brother, at the time 18, told me when I was hiding and when he joined that small group of partisans. Again, he was the youngest at 18 and the oldest was 24. And he came to that place where I was hiding and uh, he told me always to remember what I see, what is happening here, to tell those schools, those who do not know about what is happening, what I saw, 
And uh, well, I took that with me. And uh, certainly my family knows and the people who know me know about what was happening uh, during the war. That's, uh, that, that obligation which we Jews have stays with me. So, le door the door, it is our commandment, and I feel that uh, it's not only what happened during the war, because you see what happened during the war to us is still happening today to others. We also not only have to tell what happened to us, but we have to do all we can to help those, oh, like Rwanda, for example. Rwanda shouldn't have really allowed to happen the way it happened. The United States and other countries should have done more. But it's not only Rwanda, what happened in Yugoslavia, what happened in, 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 in Sudan. These things are still happening. What's happening in Syria today, you see? So I think it's, it's wrong to be apathetic it's wrong not to talk about these things and about, and about trying to do something about these things. Joshua, is this, do you consider yourself also part of a larger tradition and there is something you have to transmit as to make sure that it will not be forgotten? Well, certainly I, I think that's, it's, it's important and I involve myself when I can in the ways that I can, you know. Uh, I certainly believe that that remembering is e extremely important. I'm not alone in that. I think we, uh, um, all of us here believe that. And um, and so, so whenever I have a chance to be a part of something, I will because I believe that's important. You know, you're faced as, a, as an artist. It's an interesting because being an artist is quite a, in many ways, a very selfish thing because you have to lo be looking inside you're not, uh, and not outside. You'll be looking at yourself, looking at at um, I at the music and what is truth, what is all these things. So, in some ways, you could call it selfish, in, in not not the not a negative way. Um, uh, so you, you have this, you have that, but then you have this. You want to do things outwardly and help as well. And as an artist, it's one of the nice things about being an artist, uh, a performing artist, is that we have great opportunities to do something, to, to be a part of something. Uh, and I get letters almost every day from some organization. All, all of them are good. All of them are good causes, you know, for animals, for the environment, for, the, you know, there's, uh, there's so many things. And they always need, you know, someone to help bring awareness by what I can do. So I, uh, I'm not a, I'm not a talker. I'm a play. I play, and I, I can go, and people buy tickets for, for to buy a table at the event, and they raise money, and I can, they, and so I love to be able to do that. I host in my own home, things for the charities that I believe, but I, I can't do them all. You know, that's the problem. You can't do them. You have to pick and choose where you can be of, use, um, and use, and still have enough time to concentrate on your, craft and your art. This as an introduction to the thing which I came to realize that for many young people the Holocaust is no longer part of their consciousness. It is, it's really a thing of the past, mm -hmm. a, an almost forgotten past. Sigmund, how, how, how to respond to that? I mean, do we have to respect it and say, look, you know, we moved on, it's now 70 years uh, later, other things happened, and, you know, we understand this Minister of Foreign Affairs in Poland, or are there any compelling reasons why we should not forget? Well, there certainly are compelling reasons why we should not forget, if only to prevent, regrettably, these, I mentioned three of them, but there are more than just three mini holocausts happening almost all the time. Mm -hmm. And so, certainly, we should not forget. Uh, I think that uh, you could say education, education, education. And, and uh, uh, you know, I remember when I was in school, 
we still had certain subjects which were being taught, like uh, history, geography, and so on. Today, young kids, you know, uh, spend most of their time, really, not reading books, but actually playing, you know, with all of these, uh, at least in the United States, with these mi mini computers and so on. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons why uh, fewer and fewer people know about important things and are less concerned about events like, uh, like uh, Rwanda and Syria and so on. I would like to think so. I, I also, uh, I worry also, frankly, about how many young people and those who come after even these present young people will be as interested in serious music as, as they were before, as we were all before. And uh, I, I don't know whether you, whether your experience is, I mean, even well, in the I, last I, few years, similar to mine, there are, see, for example, uh, I know wh when you were playing in Częstochowa, my family, my grandchildren were with me, and uh, I tried to interest all these other people who also came there to bring their children and so on. And it, was, uh, it wasn't really all that easy to interest mm -hmm. in, in that. I'd like to make a couple of points. Um, I'll, I'm going to address that in a second. First, when you talk about education, one thing that education teaches us, so education, when we learn about the Holocaust, is six million Jews were killed. Statistics like that, does, that doesn't teach a lesson at, at all. You, a, movie, a film like this, where you see a story, a personal story, um, does much better. Uh, it, it shows much more powerfully, I think, human nature. And I think we need to remember in this way by hearing stories and really understanding it, not just a statistic, because I think you start talking about statistics and comparing whether 3,000 people that, that fell in the World Trade Center is less valuable than the 6 million, and, you know, and which lesson is more important, and who, who has bragging rights for being suffering the most based on these numbers. The fact is that you have to look at these people, the victims as individuals as well, and not just as these, as, as, as these groups, because you get desensitized to the numbers. So I think that's just, a, just one little thought. Um, the other thing I'd like to end, maybe, maybe on a more positive note in a way, because I think this question about the younger generation has been, has been addressed at every single generation going back uh, thousands probably of years. Um, and and uh, the good old days where, you know, it, but you can look at it just like the Woody Allen movie, the one, the Paris movie, I forget. He makes the whole joke about that, that every generation you realize it's the same issues, the same. And, and um, they've been talking about lamenting the, the death of the, the older audiences. This is 50 years ago, 100 years ago, you see it. Um, so I'm not so pessimistic. I think one of the... Th one of the great things about growing up and getting older is that you start taking interest in things that are more meaningful than trends. As a young person, you're interested in what's trendy and, and, and sexy and all that stuff. And as you get older, you just become more interested in, in things that are more meaningful. Unfortunately, it takes m most people a long time to, re to get to that point. Um, but I think eventually, you know, I think there should be more pe younger, younger people here in this, maybe, you know, here today. But but I think if when you do this in 30 years, there will be, it'll be, um, you know, the, the younger people will be growing up and they'll be replacing the audience here. So, so. Um, and you will be here. Uh, so, so I, 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 as far, I can relate it to music, classical music, because we, you, we hear it all the time. It's classical music dying. Is there's, um, you know, I'll, what are, I'll look at all the old people in the audience. Where's it going to go? If you actually look at classical music and what we have today, the amount of string quartet, professional string quartets that are touring the world, if you look at the amount of professional orchestras that exist, compared to the so-called heyday of classical music was the 19th century, right? All the great music was written. There were very few professional orchestras, period. There were a few. If any, if, any, if you go farther back, there, there really weren't, they weren't really professional orchestras. There were, um, we have a much richer cultural life in classical music now I think, than even in the 19th century where it supposedly this was the heyday of, of classical music. So and now we have the internet where we're streaming concerts. We, we do have young people because it's a little bit more trendy, but that's fine. 
we have younger people that are that are tuning in um, to the internet broadcasts of classical music, YouTube, all these things, and I think it's it's not it's not so dire. I think it's um, I see. I don't see it as su such a horrible uh, future when it comes to culture. I'd, maybe I'm naive, but uh, I'd like to think about it. Well, um, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Evelyn Nichols. I am <laughs> president of the Dutch Gustav Mahler Society. And what I would like to ask you, speaking about the power of music, um, how do you relate to the power of music in the concentration camps? You know, of course, that Alma Rosé Mahler um, died at Auschwitz just before the end of the war. But um, how would, do you explain that people can survive by the power of music? Certainly, um, yeah, there are amazing stories of music that was written in the concentration camps. And, 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 and one of the things, one of the aspects of music, uh, the power of music that we uh, haven't really talked about it. It's really is yes. It's it's about showing us the greatness of being a human being and the great minds of the composers. But one of the great things about art and particularly music, I'm biased. I think it's the most profound art form personally. Um, is that is the consolation? It does give us. Um, you know, when, when you're in pain, um, when you're in pain. I know this from from. Uh, from child, dealing with children when they have it, when they're sad and they're crying, what they want to hear is not how great life is, and that, like you shouldn't be upset. Life is great. They just want a little bit of sympathy. You know, you just say you're sad. I'm so sorry. I, you know, and then it, it actually that makes them feel much better. And I've learned that as a parent, as a parent now, um, that not to try to make them happy. And one of the things music does is that it just you feel when you listen to great music, sad music. It's funny, when people feel sad, they often turn on sad music. You think, why aren't they putting on happy music? Um, is that they feel sympathy, consolation, because they, 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 they feel like someone else has experienced, the person who wrote this music has experienced this in a profound way, and they're not alone, and they're not alone. And I think that's a very powerful, uh, powerful thing. Sigmund? Well... I can only tell you from personal experience that uh, every time there was a concert, every one of them illegal, in uh, what used to be at one time movie theaters and sometimes in synagogues, in shut down schools, there was never an empty seat. And I can tell you that uh, for my parents, for all those around me, these were very, very important events. And uh, even when, we, when uh, the ghetto was liquidated and we were in this uh, uh, forced labor camp, in that munitions factory and so on, in the barracks, you would have, at night, you would have three or four musicians. Somehow, there was a violin Somehow there was, I think it was a cello, but I think that it was like a handmade instrument which looked a little like cello. And you had singers. And really, uh, these were uh, evenings which everybody waited for, and everybody couldn't get enough of that music. So you see, aside of, from the orchestras, which were organized you know, in camps even like... Uh, Auschwitz, for example, where uh, the Germans liked to listen to that music. Some of the uh, greatest singers, uh, for example, Joseph uh, Schmidt, uh, sang in the camps and actually died in one of these camps. But he was singing also, not only for the Germans, he was also singing in Rosenheim, one of the camps. So. Uh, Music, music was terribly important.